All right, all right, all right. Hello, everyone. Good morning. Brian Post here with you for another fantastic session of our 16-week program. And I'm going to back my slide up real quick. There we go. Another fantastic session of the 16-week Adoption, Parenting, Coaching, and Certification program. We are now halfway through our course. I hope you all have been enjoying it. I hope it has been enlightening and informative. I know it's been challenging. I've been getting some excellent, excellent uh, responses to the homework. Uh, some of the, the most recent ones that I got were just fantastic. So I, I look forward to following up with some of you on the um, on that particular homework assignment as you continue to wrestle with things and, and toss it around and struggle and try to come out on the other side of a new paradigm. So I want to uh, commend you for your continued progress and openness and willingness to, to see things from a different light and ultimately to reformat and reformulate your paradigm for adoption parenting because this is what's going to take you into not only being a more effective parent, it's going to take you into being a more effective person is my, is my belief because this is human behavior. We, the, we are focusing in this course primarily on adoption parenting and adopted children. However, this is human behavior. This is, this is not solely exclusive to just adopted children. So again, I want to commend you. I'm excited to be here with you for another session. Halfway through the course, I want to be able to get more focused with you, um, spend more time on on each on each particular situation, each particular challenge that may come up, and just go from there. So last week we talked about understanding what doesn't work and why, and this morning in this session eight we are going to talk about understanding what works and why. And I'm going to try to go through this kind of slow because I, I want to be very thorough. We have, we have 16 weeks together. I want to make sure that you are getting as much of, of the, the perspective as I can possibly share with you. That's why I'm, I'm spending time. I've got these broken down somewhat and, and really elaborating for you. And if I feel like we've gone in, in one particular session, I'm trying to keep them to one hour. I feel like a one hour is a very good time frame. It, it, it allows you enough time to be able to follow up uh, during the week and listen to it again without taking up too much of your time away from your other work and your other family, your family. But at the same time, it's, uh, it's not too brief, you know, and, and so I, I want to be able to provide you with a very complete picture of all the dynamics that go into this parenting model. So we just want to start here with a refresher of the brain. And as we talk about the specific dynamics of what works, what doesn't work, etc., I want you to always be able to come back and this is your paradigm. This is your, your, your paradigm. I want you to be able to come back with this. As Bruce Perry says, you have to have a, if you work with traumatized children, you have to have a generalist understanding of the brain. And that's important. Uh, Stephen Cubby says, to understand but to not do is to not understand. To understand but to not do is to not understand. And so many times we say, oh, yeah, yeah, I get that, or I understand that, but we're doing opposite of that, and, and we don't, we don't want to do that. I mean, if we, if we do the opposite to what we profess to understand, then I want you to understand why you're doing it. I want you to think about it that way. Because there are times when we're going to revert back to our old parenting uh, blueprints, and we revert back to those old parenting blueprints, and that's not something to be judgmental about. It's just something to recognize and look at and to understand why it is that you're doing what you're doing. So well, as we start talking about what works and what doesn't, we'll be same thing looking at the amygdala. If in our parenting tools and techniques we are increasing stress, fear, 
ultimately cortisol, by creating more threat, then what we're going to be doing is increasing amygdala activation. The amygdala, here's what's a little scientific fact between the amygdala and the hippocampus, is that the amygdala forms new neural connections as it is activated. So the more it, it gets activated, kind of the, the, the stronger, it's just like a muscle, the stronger it becomes, the bigger it gets, if you will, and the more sensitive it gets. And so if you think about, I'm using this red pen right now, if you think about the heat that builds up in the sensitivity of the amygdala to give you a, a very good, a, a couple of really good um, examples of this is I've got a new puppy. Her name is Baby. She's 10 weeks old. She's a bull mastiff, a female bull mastiff. And it's been very interesting because I've only had her for one week. But the things that have gone on in that one week are absolutely amazing. You know, the first day she was fearful of everything. I mean, she would just cower down. She every every little sound, she would be looking, freezing, startling. Her amygdala was so activated. It was just very interesting to watch. And then just over the span of about three, four days, her amygdala really started to relax more. But what science tells us is that your amygdala, once it is developed, it never it never shrinks, whereas with your, with your hippocampus, your hippocampus is, is actually damaged when, when experiencing stress. Dendrites in your hippocampus will actually shrink and shrivel. So where your amygdala is getting bigger, your hippocampus is actually progressively getting smaller and less effective because of the, the, dendri the dendri dendritic and synaptic shrinkage that occurs when facing stress and trauma. Well, what science tells us is that when we experience prolonged regulation and ultimately healing therapeutic environments, the hippocampus actually has the ability to regenerate. So it can actually regenerate. Whereas the, hippo, whereas the amygdala doesn't regenerate. It stays at its own sensitivity. But what it can do is it can form new pathways for reacting. So see, it, it, does, it does not have to continue to react in the same negative way. It can, it, but it's not going to shrink and triple, but it can form new pathways for reacting. And as it forms new pathways for reacting, also what is occurring and what can occur is our oxytocin response starts to develop. So if the things that we're doing in our parenting technique and approach is creating more stress, more fear, more cortisol, ultimately more cortisol, it's by creating more threat, then it's going to be ineffective. Uh, and it's, it's going to be arresting our ability to truly help our children heal. When, when in fact what we want to do is be creating opportunities consistent opportunities for, for oxytocin, um, oxytocin release and ultimately helping our children learn how to release oxytocin uh, on their own. So as I said in the, last, in the last session, it all comes back to the relationship. We are biologically engineered to be in relationship. Biologically engineered to be in relationship. And our initial drive as a species is not survival. It is relationship. So if we, are, if we are biologically engineered to be in relationship, then the single most important thing is the relationship. And I think that parents fail to realize this. And let me tell you why the relationship is the most important. Because parenting is a journey. It is a process that brings you regular outcomes, okay? So you may have, you, you, your child may be 10 years old. 
But that child's going to be your child forever until you take your last breath. From a focus of behavior that, that our culture pursues, that our culture tends to be obsessed with and by, you actually lose relationship. We, we, we live in a very controlling and, and, and uh, suppressive society. So, so many of our relationships are dominated by control and suppression. And the challenge with that is that as your child ages, as your child gets older, they will feel less and less inclined to be, in, to be controlled. Because ultimately, we all need to have some control over our lives. I mean, that's uh, something that's very important for foster children. I remember Bruce Perry saying that, that, that children who've experienced trauma, foster children, adopted ch children especially, they have to have some modicum of control over their lives because that is how they create predictability. That is how they create consistency. And, and so I mentioned I had two examples of kind of amygdala activation. Um, this ties into control. Last night, my wife and, and some of our employees have, were at a, at a conference, and we're in, I'm in San Antonio currently, and I was back at the hotel, and she had said that she wanted to go out and have dinner, maybe even go out and do some dancing. So I would kind of been preparing myself all evening for that. Um, not that that's like the, that is not on the top of my things for enjoyment. Um, I don't mind going out and, and dance for a little while, but my wife loves to dance. Like she will dance for five hours straight without stopping, except to have a drink of water. That's, that's not my, I mean, I reach my window of tolerance pretty quick when it comes to, to being in, in an environment with lots and lots and lots of noise and lots of people. But it, the dancing actually releases oxytocin for her, and for me, I am relying on my window of tolerance for a period of time, which allows me to have a good time for a while, but eventually my oxytocin stops responding, and my cortisol starts to rise and rise and rise, and then it's no longer fun for me. So I've been preparing myself all pretty much, you know, for three or four hours that, you know, this was coming, and I was looking forward to it, and I, I was looking forward to the time together. And so it starts getting a little later, and she texts that, that they're on the way back, and they had gotten lost, and so she needed the address, what have you. And so she gets to the door, and she comes in, and she says, I've got some really bad news. All right, so that's the first stressor. So I'm like, well, what is it? She said, I think I broke my hand. She said, I broke the board. But I think I broke my hand. So they had gone, the part of the seminar was a, a karate, a karate em, em, emotional breakthrough, empowering breakthrough kind of uh, uh, workshop, and they were doing board breaking, you know, to conquer your fears and, and what have you. And so she holds up, you know, she's this broken board, and then she holds up her hand, and I'm like, oh, my gosh. And so I jump up, and, you know, I, I immediately kind of revert back to my – sports days, and I'm like, well, let me get you some ice, and so I go and get her a bucket of ice, and then I put water in it, because that's what we always do, you see, if you immerse the, the injury into a cold bucket of water, it's like, you can't get any colder than that, it'll immediately numb it, and bring the swelling down, and so you, really then you can see what you're working with, but she didn't, she didn't want to, oh, she put her hand in the, in the bucket, she's like, oh, that hurts, that hurts, and she said, I don't want to do that, I don't want to do that, and so I just, I, I just got completely stressed out. So initially, initially I start out wanting to help because I'm a little stressed because she's injured. But then when she starts not wanting my help, I, feel re I felt rejected. Immediately I felt rejected. I mean, it was intense, too. Because I'm what, I mean, it's like the, it's like the shame experience. And, and the experience of shame is that your amygdala is getting activated and suddenly it gets co completely slammed down. So it gets completely shut down. It's not even your 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 amygdala is is releasing um, your excitement hormones, your cortisol, and your adrenaline, and then you get slammed down 
with whatever external threat or fear or shame. And that, that actually, that dynamic, it's the gas and the brakes applied instantly at the same time, which is what causes the reaction of shame. So I, I think I probably felt some shame, some frustration, some helplessness, and I just said, fine, whatever. I mean, you're, you're the doctor. You tell me what you, what you want. And I just laid back on the bed and was like, just completely rejected and upset. And she was like, well, I'm the one who's hurt. What are you upset about? And it, it took me a while to recover because it was, it was pretty intense interpersonally. And, you know, I just, I just sat there. I said, well, what do you want me to do? I said, I, I tried to help. You don't want that help. So what do you need? What do you want me to do? And so we eventually worked our way through it, went to Walgreens, got her bandage, what have you. She said she didn't think it was broke, although I think it probably does have a hairline fracture. And she said, what are you upset about? And I said, well, I was trying to help. I said, you needed my help. She said, I didn't ask for your help. And I said, you know what? You're right. You didn't ask for my help. And that was the truth. She didn't really technically ask me to help. She was just telling me she was injured. But I, because of my need to be um, okay, because of my need to be accepted, my need to be good enough, what have you, unconsciously I kind of jumped into, into action, and then when she rebuffed that or rejected it, my perception was that she rejected it, um, the reality is that she just, she's never been an athlete, so she doesn't know what that feels like. And so we were able to, you know, get on through that, and I was able to settle my amygdala down, and we were able to get a little oxytocin flowing, and then we went on out and had dinner, and um, realized that we were all exhausted just from from the travel and everything else, and that going out was not, you know, the best thing. In fact, I said, I just, I'm just not. I'm tired. I, I can't go out tonight. I will go out um, tomorrow. So, anyway, it's important to understand that relationship is a long-term focus. It is realizing that I am going to be this child's parent, or I'm going to be in this relationship for, for a long period of time. And it's interesting, I'm going to share this with you all, I, that in the middle of the night, at some point in the middle of the night, and I know that this, this happens when I've been under a lot of stress. And I've been under a lot of stress with the, the passing of my, my daughter's mother, then Marley, my 10-year-old, had to have an emergency surgery. And, and then just doing lots of driving and then having to go travel for a few days and do a lecture. And so it's just been a lot of a lot of stress. And so somewhere in the middle of the night, and then thinking about my mother with Mother's Day coming up, and I, I had a dream that Tammy, my wife, had died and we were having her funeral. And I started, it's like initially in the dream, my 10-year-old son was kind of throwing some paper, a gum wrapper or something, but his eyes were kind of red. He was sad, and he got down. He got out of his chair. He went, and he, because I said, Donnie, don't do that, and he, and, and he went and was giving Marley a hug, which would never happen, you know, that's his 10-year-old stepsister, so that's like never happened. He was giving Marley a hug, and I sat down beside him, and I could tell how sad he was. And I was about to reach down and pick him up. And then I just had the thought in my dream in that moment. I was like, oh, my gosh, my wife is dead. I'm never going to see her again. And, and I, all, all the things that I love and appreciate about her uh, just were flashing through my mind. And I just started to cry in my sleep. And then when I woke up, I was still crying. I was still very emotionally upset. And, of course, she, she wakes up and holds me. And I, I kind of continue to have my process. And, just realized that I was really stressed and that that's probably what that was about. But, you know, relationship is long term and we get into such a short term focus in our life and with our children. We think that right now is the end all be all this moment. If I don't get this child doing what they're supposed to be doing in this moment, then, you know, something terrible is going to happen and and we're not going to be able to be in relationship with one another and, and, you know, it's, 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 it's not going to end well. So then we get all behavior focused. And when we get all behavior focused like that, we're not doing one another any favors. I mean, we're, we're all, the only time you seek to control is when you are stressed out and scared. It's the only time you seek to, to, to control. 
And when, you, when you're not, you can focus on relationship. And it's interesting because I'm getting to have this kind of process with my little puppy. And I'm having to go into it very mindfully, you know, that I want to love and nurture her. And I called her, I named her baby intentionally. She's a bull mastiff. She's going to be over 100 pounds. She's going to be huge. But I want her to be babied. Like, I want to have healthy attachment. We were getting ready to go out of town for a few days, and I just had her. And I was thinking, oh, my gosh, I'm going to have to kennel. I'm going to have to kennel her, and I so don't want to do that. And so I was having a lot of anxiety, and so I found a friend of mine who said he'd come over and house set. And so I was so happy because at least then she would get the consistency of home. She wouldn't have to, to leave the home she's starting to get familiar with. And I, I knew she could kind of adjust to, to a new presence fairly well as long as she was in her environment. So I think what's important about that is I'm have as I'm as I'm parenting this new dog, I'm having these opportunities to practice mindfulness, to be patient. And we're going to get into talking about that. To be patient and practice mindfulness as she learns to come when I say come, come baby. I'm outside, uh, poop, pee pee. Night, night, you know, I'm, I'm making all these statements repetitive. It's all repetition, right? And when she pees, because right now I kind of I let her out in the in the kitchen area because we have tile, and it's you know occasionally if I leave her out too long, then she'll pee pee on the floor. And I remember as a kid when when we were we had a dog. Like, we usually had a dog here and there. Not never two. We always had one at a time. But my dad had a dog named Tasha for years and years and years. But I remember when he was, you know, potty training Tasha and she would pee on the floor. He'd rub her nose on it and he'd 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 yell and he'd get a newspaper and he would spank her on the butt with the newspaper and then he would toss her outside and blah, all this crazy dramatic dra traumatic um experiencing over this dog, you know, tinkling on the floor, which, you know, they're, they're not kids. They don't have diapers. You know, we, we have to potty train them in much the same way. So, you know, realizing every time that I've let, it's happened twice, I think, every time I've let baby out and left her out for too long and she's peed in the kitchen or something and I've, I've had to clean it up, it's my fault. So just, and this is interesting because it's happened a couple times and I've said, you know, to my wife and, and, and my son hears me and, you know, Marley hears it. It's, I should have, I should have crated her and I shouldn't have left her out too long. I'm, I'm sorry, baby, I left you out too long. It's okay. I'm going to clean this up and, and we get it cleaned up and the other day we were down the street at the clinic and. I had crated her before I left, but Donnie at some point had let her out. We live like three minutes away uh, from our clinic, and Donnie had let her out, and she had tinkled and peed and pooped in the kitchen. And, you know, I was like, oh, my gosh, what happened? He's like, well, she was whining because it was raining, and I thought she wanted to be out. And I said, that's fine, but we got to clean it up. And he said, I'm sorry, baby. I'm sorry for not letting you out. That was, I, I was like, that is so cool. I didn't say anything because I don't feel like it's necessary to always say to kids, that's great. You know, it's good that you said blah, 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 blah. It, it's, it's natural. I believe in natural parenting. And so... But it was cool because he was modeling what he had heard. And that's the significance of this whole parenting message is it's all about modeling because it's all about relationship. And, and you may be struggling in your relationship with your child right now, but you have to understand that what you're doing with your child right now is going to carry forward with them for the rest of their life. So that the messages and the experiences they have with you right now, you know, it, it may sometimes it may just feel like hell. It may feel like you're completely overwhelmed, but you are planting seeds that they will carry with them for the rest of their life. So the relationship factor says that if we are biologically engineered to be in relationship, every dendrite, every synapse, every cell. 
then relationship becomes the single most important thing. And once you lose the relationship, you lose everything. Once you lose the relationship, you lose everything. And, and that happens in parenting all the time. We, we spend time with our children and, and, and we're, you know, focused on control and behaviors, etc. And then when things happen and, and, and they get older, they reach adolescence and all of a sudden it, it's not, we, we lose relationship with them. And they, they go to their friends and they go to all other kind of ways to, to calm their stress. So focus on relationship. See the importance. Even when you mess up, even when you mess up, come back and restore the relationship and then you move on. And so that kind of, as I was thinking this morning, it kind of reminded me of, you know, some of the parenting things here we're going to talk about, I really want to, I, I want to move away. I want you to work on moving away from any kind of tool or technique-based parenting. Because it, it, it's, it's, a, it's adoption parenting, it's not adoption therapy, it's adoption parenting. And I believe that any time you are utilizing tools and techniques, then that, that is more, it's more like therapy. And I think that that's probably one of the problems with therapy is that it's, it's too, it's too tool and technique based. It's too theory based. It's, it's uh, not relational enough. It's not emotional enough. It's not connected enough. And I want to encourage you to move away from those, from tool and technique based parenting. Because if you spend, if you spent a week with me, interacting with my own children. Whatever challenges that may come up, you will rarely see me use a parenting tool or a parenting technique. I don't talk that language. Um, I don't communicate that way to my children. I'm just parenting. I'm naturally mindfully parenting and, and utilize some of the things we're going to talk about. So I just want to put that out there and well, I'll, I'll return to that thought here in a minute. So as we're talking about what works and what doesn't and, and I, I want to just I want to summarize again the three pathways of emotional expression because I think it, it's a, a fundamental it goes into the fundamental understanding of the model right along with the stress model, and right along with the parenting continuum. I, I believe the, the three pathways of emotional expression is, is a fundamental, kind of a, a, there's a fundamental understanding that goes into the, the foundation of this model. And it, it's, we all have three pathways to which to express our emotions. Why do we express our emotions? Any time we must transition. Any time we must make an adjustment. We must go through a process of emotional expression, of expression. Why? Emotion is energy in motion. Your body only knows two energetic states. You should know what these are. This is going to be on the quiz. Two energetic states, thriving and surviving. Love, fear. So those energetic states correlate to these emotional states. Okay? So anytime we have to make an, a, a, a transition or an adjustment of any sort, it requires an emotional transition. There's an energy created we must express through that energy, which then allows our bodies and our brains to settle down to, to do what we need to do. One of the first ways we do that is through attitudes. And that's the rolling the eyes. Sometimes that's a little talking back. That's the huffing and the puffing. Um, that's, that, you know, it, it's just the kind of the day-to-day -day stuff. And here's what I want you to understand. Here's what I want you to understand about this is that Attitudes and feelings, this is, how we, this is how we operate in society. Anytime 
there's 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 an experience and interaction. You have attitudes and feelings. When your spouse says something, when your mother says something, when your boss says something, your coworker says something that you don't like or, or asks you to do something, you have an attitudinal experience about it. And if the attitudinal experience is not enough or it's not okay, then you'll have a feeling experience about it. So attitudes and feelings, is, is, it's what we do. This is how we, we operate with one another. This is normal. This is normal. Attitudes and feelings is normal. But see, what happens as children, as children, we go through a process of having attitudes and feelings suppressed. We go to behavior. We make our way down to depression and anger in some instances. And then as we get older, we come back up to attitudes and feelings. See, a lot of times, if we've had, when we, you know, we start out over here, if we've had some, some healthy parenting, see, we have a, a foundation, I'm kind of a, a, healthy, a healthy parenting foundation, then we have a foundation, even though our attitudes and our feelings get suppressed down to behaviors. Now, we may not stay, depending on how long you stay down here. Remember, I, I say that this is, uh, any time you stay down here, probably from three to six months. So you, your, your trauma triangle is essentially when you, for three to six months, you have prolonged amounts of stress, you have prolonged amounts of fear. That is ultimately which leads to trauma, which you all know is any stressful event which is prolonged, overwhelming, and unpredictable. Okay? Another quiz question for you. So if we stay down here long enough in the trauma triangle and our attitudes have been suppressed, our feelings have been suppressed, and our behavior has been suppressed, then we only have two options, and that's anger and depression. And anger and depression have to come out through behavior one way or the other. So, so if we've had healthy parenting to begin with, we will eventually just naturally be able to work ourselves back up here as we become adults. Because we have enough, we have enough, um, so what goes into a, a healthy parenting foundation? From a brain-based perspective, what goes into a healthy parenting foundation? And I'm, I'm just going to let you think about that for just a moment. Well, at the, at the, at the most basic level, okay, what would you say? I hope the very first thing you say is oxytocin. At the most basic level, what goes into a healthy parenting foundation is oxytocin. You have experienced enough oxytocin for that to be supportive to your brain. And then what would you say? Well, what, what, are, what are all the things that go into oxytocin in regards to creating opportunities for oxytocin? It's, it's, it's basically nurturing. You've had healthy levels of nurturing. You've had uh, appropriate stress, stress intervention. So you've not been allowed to be stressed too long. Okay? And what, what else would you say? You've, you've had uh, consistency, which, you know, also becomes security. You know, it's just at a, at, a, at a very foundational level. When you've had this, you are able to, even, even though traditional parenting, even though you may grow up in a home where your attitudes are suppressed and your feelings are suppressed all the way down to your behaviors, and maybe you spend, maybe you, maybe you have spent a, a little time down here in, in the trauma triangle, but you, you managed to get yourself out of it, right, over time. 
and maybe you never were there for really three to six months. Maybe you just drop down there temporarily and you get a little bit older and you develop, you know, your, your oxytocin, your, your cortisol oxytocin uh, response is a little bit more balanced. There's a little bit more balance between the two. Well, as you get older, you increasingly, you think about, you know, our orbital frontal cortex, our executive control center for our social and emotional relationships, completing its development at the age of 25. Well, you're, you're developing a little greater capacity to think through your emotions. So you're able to have, you're able to rely on more attitudes and feelings than behaviors. So it's very important. Uh, however, if you have not experienced the Healthy Parenting Foundation, then you're going to be in trouble, you know, because then, then you're going to be looking at having your attitude suppressed and your feelings suppressed and your behavior suppressed. You have no, no ability, no real, real foundational ability to release oxytocin in the midst of your cortisol, so you get stuck down here at the level of anger, anger and depression. It comes out as behaviors, and because of our society, you know, we just continue to try to suppress the behavior. And so, as an adult, you are you are as dysfunctional as you were as a child. Essentially, no real healing takes place. And as we think about the three pathways of emotional expression, we think about that in relationship to behavior. The only way we work a, a, a child out of this is we have to be able to see them through their behavior. So let's, let's talk about that. And I'm going to most likely we will spend most of next session talking about the three pathways of emotional expression in relationship to specific behaviors. So... We have the, the, the parenting, exploring the parenting paradigm and we, we, the continuum, exploring the parenting continuum, we, we, we spent a lot of time, um, really we spent all of uh, last week talking about the negative side and we didn't spend much talking about the love-based side, but we're going to spend the next two sessions talking about the love-based side at least. Um, the first we have is time in. So the, the first, the first, you know, part of the of the parenting continuum is time in, and time in obviously is the opposite to time out. Time in is based on the premise that a child does not have an effective ability in the moment to regulate their behaviors. So if, if you if you have if you have a, a core understanding that when we are stressed out we act out then time in makes all the sense in the world to you when you have a core understanding that that children don't act out for attention act out for attention Act out for children act out because. See, a child doesn't act out for attention. A child acts out because they need attention, right? You get that? See, a child's not acting out for attention. See, that's a that's a real that's a real mindset that we have in our society. I can't tell you how many times parents parents say that kind of thing. But my child's acting out for attention. He's not acting out for attention. He's acting out because he, he needs attention. And what he needs is, is regulation. What he needs is oxytocin. What he needs is someone to help him to, to calm his cortisol response because he, he obviously cannot calm it himself. Why did I say he obviously cannot calm it himself? Because he is demonstrating to you in his negative behaviors that he is outside of his window of tolerance, that he is dysregulated. Now, I had a, a parent at a seminar recently say, well, well what about a child who... It's not, how do you know the difference between a trauma-based reaction versus just a, I'm not getting my way reaction? 
It's simple. It's all stress. And acting out child is a stressed out child. It's all stress. It doesn't matter. There's, there's no difference between the two. So when you, when you do time in with a child, essentially what you're saying is, is I am recognizing in this moment that my child has gone outside of their window of tolerance. Instead of sending them to their room or sending them to the corner to figure out to, by, by themselves, they need my regulatory ability. I can't tell you. I practice this routinely with my, with my 10-year-old son especially because... And we practice this routinely in the group home. And it's, again, it's not tool and technique. It's a recognition. It's an understanding that, look, you have exceeded your window of tolerance. You're not in a good space. So you need to hang out with me. We'll hang out. We'll spend some time together, and, and everything's going to be okay. And what, what you can see, and, and it becomes, um, It becomes an act of responsibility. See, that we, we, we go back here. E everything on this side of the continuum is going to be about responsibility. Everything on this side of the continuum is going to be about me taking responsibility. So when I am uh, practicing a time in, and, and, and there, is no, there is no age per minute per age time frame with time in. Because nine times out of ten, the child is actually going to prefer being connected with you. Now, maybe not initially, because initially they're not going to want to, you know, in some situations you say to a child, hey, come over here and hang out with me. Come spend some time with me. They're not going to want to. They're going to want to, they're, 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 you're a threat in that moment. So that's what you need to understand. When you see your child acting out, you say, you know what, I don't feel like you're in a very good space. Why don't you come spend some time with me? Why don't you just come over here? You know what? You're going to go with me. I don't want to go with you. I understand you don't want to go with me, but you're not in a very good space right now. And if I leave you, I, I want you all to follow, listen to what I am saying. It's not a tool or a technique. There is a feeling that corresponds with a statement. And there, there is an understanding which assists the feeling that corresponds with the statement. So... The understanding, which is the understanding of love and fear, which is the understanding of cortisol and oxytocin, which is the understanding of the necess necessity of responsibility. See, the understanding generates a feeling. And, and these are almost, these are almost, um, what's that word? It's not interactive. It's not interconnected. Um. It's not intrinsic. Interchangeable. Understanding and feeling is almost interchangeable. Your understanding and your feeling, these are all, these are all cellular. I mean, this is, this is a cellular experience. I mean, this is a knowing. So, so it's, it's a knowing, an understanding, a feeling. It all becomes... Um, It all becomes interchangeable. But what happens is that the understanding, the feeling, the knowing is it it, it, it informs the response. That's, this is why the understanding is so important, because without, without the right understanding, so, you, you know, if you're operating over here, your feeling is going to be different. And when your feeling is different, it's not a response, it's a reaction. And then the response dictates the statement. Okay, so when, when the child is acting out, and we're still focused on time in, and you say, I can tell you're not in a very good place. Why don't you come spend some, why don't you come just hang out over here? You know what? You're going to go with me. You know what? 
come in the house for a while. Let, let's get you settled down. You know what? You're just, you're not in a good space right now. So let's just hang out. The child in that moment is going to see you as a threat that you, you cannot expect. You cannot expect that the child's going to be like, oh, yeah, okay, that's great. You must expect that they're going to be like, oh, no, I don't want to do that because they're already escal ex escalated. They're already in a negative state. So don't expect them to whistle Dixie and come hopping over to you happily because it, it's not a reality and, and you should not expect it. You should expect just the opposite. That, see, that, that goes back to the understanding and the feeling. The feeling changes your response, which, which informs your statement. So as soon as they say, I don't want to, or I don't like you, or I hate you, no way I'm not going to do that, you take a deep breath. You just breathe because you expected it. And then you say, I understand. I, I, I get it. I get it. And, and literally what I am saying to you all right now, how I am saying it is exactly how I would say it in any given situation. You're absolutely right. I know you're not in a very good place, and I know you probably don't want to spend a lot of time with me. However, I can tell how stressed out you are. See, completely non-threatening. Not only is it completely non-threatening, but I am in a place where I can actually offer an oxytocin opportunity. I can tell taking responsibility. I can tell that you're not in a good space right now, and if I let you continue to be taking responsibility, see, taking responsibility, if I let you, if I allow you to continue to do this, and then you get hurt, or you, your friends get mad at you, or something bad happens, guess what? That's me being a bad parent, and I don't want to be a bad parent. Well, I don't care. I don't care about you being a bad parent. See, at this point, you've, you've already bridged the gap. At this point, as soon as the child is engaging you in conversation, you've already bridged the gap. You've already hit the home run. Maybe not hit the home run. You're, you're definitely on second base as soon as they're engaging you because you got them. You've got them at that point because you're creating a, a feedback loop that is lessening their reactivity. And then you say, I understand. Just come over. Let's, let's spend some time. Just, just come with me for a little bit. It's, it's going to be okay. I'm not going to do it. Okay. And then you don't do anything. Right? Because you don't want to get into a battle of increasing the cortisol. So let's say they're out playing and they just say they're, they're not going to do it. I remember this happened in Canada. It's one of the first times this really clicked for me. Tyler was playing and he was cussing. And, and I said, Tyler, you know, come on over, buddy. And, and you know, at first he came over and he hung out for a little while. And then, um, oh, no, he didn't the first time. He was like, no, I'm not going to. And Tyler was known for running away. And so he, like, was cussing, and he was, he was mad at me. He saw me as a threat. I was 10 feet away. I was 20 feet away. I was on the other side of the, 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 uh, the, play, the play thing. And so Tyler goes over to the other side, and he kind of starts kicking around. He starts kind of moving away like, like he might take off running. I did not move. And I kind of acted like I was ignoring him, but I was pretty locked in with him. And he was over there. He was waiting for me to come towards him. See, that's, his, that, that's the reactivity. He was waiting for me to come towards him so he could take off running. But I didn't, and that changed the dynamic. So he'd look up. He was kicking. He'd look up, and every now and then I'd just wave, over, wave him back over to me. And it took about three minutes. But finally, as he made circles, kicked dirt, cussed, he came all the way through the gym, the play gym thing, all the way over to me and sat down beside me. That's the power of knowing, understanding, which generates a feeling. Knowing, having knowing, having an understanding, which generates a feeling, which generates a response, which generates and influences a statement. In a lot of instances, the child, they, they, you know, they might fuss. They may argue with you initially, but they're eventually going to come over. 
this is um, it's interesting because we have hit our one hour mark and we are just now getting started um, what did I just do we are just now getting started so I'm gonna keep this we're, we're gonna wrap up this session which is good because it just means you got that much more to come and next week we will continue on this but we're, I'm gonna go through I'm gonna go through all of these exchanges these, these experiences these dynamics with you and I want to give you examples because I, I've you know I, this is this is a, a way uh, it's a the way of parenting a way of parenting it is a way of living but I, I'm going to go through these tools and techniques but I want you to transcend tools and techniques I don't want you to think about giving a child a time in. I just want you to do it naturally. I don't want you to to think about spending time with your child as a way of of doing ten twenty ten, or or I don't want you to think about reducing the child the, the, the reducing the space your child is in as a as a way of practicing containment. I want you to do it naturally. I don't want it to be tools and techniques. I don't want you to ever say to someone else. Have you ever thought about using this tool in this situation? I don't want you to do that. I want you to have an understanding which influences your communication and says, have you ever considered looking at it this way and then thinking about what your response might be if you look at it from this way? Because, see, then it's natural. and None of this stuff is like rocket science. It's just not. It's just it's just natural parenting. So I want to thank you all for joining me for this session. I, I hope it's been informative. I know it's been is a little more low key than some of our, our other sessions, which is good. We need a little low key. Can't you can't have OBP amped up all the time. I'm sure it's gonna come. It's not done. But um God bless you. May God keep you safe. May you continue to to parent from the most wise mature place that you possibly can so that you are raising up the most mature children that you possibly can and i will see you in the next session